see you all again. We do want to say thank you for your faithful prayers and support. We are one of your missionaries serving in the or here in Ontario. Um, we are in Orangeville, Ontario. Orangeville is a town, uh, some of you know, about 30,000 people. There was a church that was established there back in 2012. It was called, um, yeah, 2012. It was called Calvary Baptist Church. The church was going well, and then in 2014, the pastor resigned, and they had not had a pastor since 2014. What happens when uh, there is no shepherd? The sheep wander. When we moved up to Orangeville in March, the church was down to eight people. We've been running between 17. We had a high, I believe, of 24 on Easter Sunday. We are excited about what God is doing, and we want to say thank you for your faithful prayers and support. If you would, open your Bibles this morning to Hosea chapter 9. Hosea chapter 9. As you find it, if you will stand in honor of reading God's Word, I know we read this earlier in our service, we're going to read it again this morning. Hosea chapter 9, we're going to begin reading in verse 4. Hosea chapter 9, we'll begin reading in verse 4. And they shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, for their bread, for their soul, shall not come into the house of the Lord. What will ye do in the solemn day, and in the day of the feast of the Lord? For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up, Memphis shall bury them, the pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them, thorns shall be in their tabernacles. The days of visitation are come, the days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it, the prophet is a fool, the spiritual man is mad, for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare of the fowler, in all his ways and hatred in the house of his God, they have corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity. He will visit their sins. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that we have the privilege of coming into your presence. Lord, we understand this morning that we have entered into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Most Holy One. Lord, we come before you humbly this morning, recognizing that we need you. Lord, we have gathered this morning to sing songs of praise, to sing songs of worship to you for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for Calvary, for the shed blood of your son, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven. Lord, as we've come to this point, as we open your word, as we look at what you have for us this morning out of your word, I ask God that you would touch my heart that you would encourage me and strengthen me in my walk with you, that you would touch your people, that you would encourage them and strengthen them in their walk with you. May we leave this place in just a few short minutes knowing that we have met with you today, and that you have done a work in our hearts and lives. In your name we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. As we get started this morning, I have a question, and I'm going to direct the question primarily at the ladies of the auditorium of the congregation, but guys, you're, feel free to answer too. How many of you have a cast iron skillet at home? Looking across the auditorium, it looks like, and I couldn't see everybody, but it looks like just about every family has a cast iron skillet at home. A cast iron skillet is one of my favorite pans. I love it. When we went to Korea and we were serving there, I shipped our cast iron skillets with us. Now, 
you know how heavy those things are. When we came to Canada, I had to give up my cast iron skillets, and so we went back and we got some new ones. And let me just tell you, new ones don't work like the old ones worked. Those of you that, that are familiar in cooking with cast iron skillets, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is so much that can be done with a cast iron skillet. If it's properly seasoned, you can fry eggs without them sticking, and they'll just slide right out of the pan. But it has to be treated correctly. If a cast iron skillet is not treated correctly, if it's not cleaned and seasoned well, it has a tendency to rust. I remember growing up in northern Indiana, we loved doing yard sailing, and, and we were out yard sailing one day, and my mom, I was not that familiar with cast iron skillets, and my mom found this old rusted pan. And I was like, that thing's worthless. And she was like, oh no, you ain't seen it yet. And she was really excited. But it looked all nasty and grimy, and really, it was not usable as it was intended until it had been cleaned up. Ideally, if you have a cast iron skillet and you use it, you want to prevent it from getting to that nasty, grimy, rusty stage. And you know what to, what to do and how to go about doing that. But if you don't use it, if you don't keep it oiled, if you don't take care of it, it has a tendency to begin to rust. We don't set out to let our cast iron skillets rust. It just happens through neglect of just not taking care of it. I want you to remember this morning, the same thing can happen in our spiritual lives as well. You say, Brother Elliot, what do you mean? Well, you see, our spiritual lives is a lot like a cast iron skillet. And I'm going to keep coming back to the cast iron skillet this, eve, this morning. I want you to grasp this, and I, and I just pray that this is a, an illustration as we go through the message that, that will stick with you. You see, we don't set out to let our cast iron skillets begin to rust. I don't know any lady or any guy that regularly uses a cast iron skillet that would just say, okay, I'm just going to put it off to the side and let it become all rusty. It just happens through neglect. In our spiritual lives, we don't set out to become rusty in our spiritual lives either. But it happens through neglect. In our text today, in the book of Hosea, we read a passage of scripture that for many people is hard to understand. We look at this, these passages, especially in some of the minor prophets, and we say, that was such a long time ago. What was taking place? It just really has no bearing today. I want to, pro I want to propose to you today that the spiritual condition that the Israelite nation found themselves in a condition of, spirit, of being spiritually rusty is very similar to the condition that many Christians find themselves in today. You see, they had um, all of the forms and all of the trappings of religion. The Israelite nation was God's people. God had chosen them. God had blessed them. God had said that every nation of the world would be blessed within the Israelite people. And that act, that, that's true. That, that has taken place. God intended Israel to be a watchman with God. Israel was to be in fellowship with him and, and experience his blessings. But instead of loving God and walking in his ways... They hated him and departed from his ways. Israel had become a snare to the nations of the world. They had become spiritually rusty. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying because they, they had not turned their back on all of their religious activities. They were still going to the temple. 
They were still going and serving, as far as they knew, serving God. They were still offering their sacrifices. They were still giving their offerings. They were still going through the motions of religion. But they'd missed the boat. They had become spiritually rusty. They had a form of religiousness, but no relationship with the Creator. And if you and I are not careful, if we're not careful in our own spiritual lives, we can fall into the same trap that the nation of Israel fell into. So this morning, I would like us to consider this idea of spiritually rustiness. And as we consider this idea of spiritually rustiness, I'd like you to ask yourself, have I become rusty? Am I that cast iron skillet that has been put off to the side that is not fulfilling its intended purpose and just become rusty? I want us to see this morning the procedure for becoming rusty. If we're going to consider spiritual rust, we must consider and we must define what we're talking about. So we're going to look at how we become spiritually rusty. When we get done looking at how we become spiritually rusty, we're going to look at how we can um, prevent spiritual rust in our own lives. And then for those of us that may have begun to become rusty, we're going to look at how we can purge spiritual rust out of our lives. First, let us consider the procedure for becoming rusty. You and I, as a believer, as a Christian, we become spiritually rusty when we elevate form over substance. When we elevate form over substance. Another way of saying this is that we elevate religion over relationship. This was one of the main issues in the book of Malachi. It was one of the main things that the prophets spoke against in the Old Testament. If you would, open to the book of Malachi with me. The last book of the Old Testament, right before the Gospel of Matthew. Malachi chapter 1. We're going to read verses 6 through 10. Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priests that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor, and will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand." The Israelites were active in fulfilling the form of the law. They were giving sacrifices. They were giving offerings. They were supporting the work of the ministry. They were going through the motions. They were serving in the temple. They were doing everything that people would say, that is a good religious Jew. but there was no substance. There was no relationship. In the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul warns Timothy about the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, 
Catch the last verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Put it differently, there was no authenticity in what was taking place. They had religion, but they did not have relationship. They were simply going through the motions. They were simply fulfilling all of the ideas of what everyone said was a good Christian person. But there was no power to their lives. There was no authenticity. There was no relationship with the Creator and the Lord of hosts. How easy it is for you and I to just simply go through the motions. It happens in marriages. It might begin with little or no quality communication, time al- not having the time alone, you're just busy in life, just going to work and going home and getting up and going doing the same thing day after day after day and before too long. There's just a staleness of dual routine or just going through the motions in the family home. It happens in work, ho ho, off to work we go. Doing the same thing, the same time every day, just going through the motions. And it happens in church, too. We get up on Sunday morning after a long, exhausting week. We're tired. We don't really want to crawl out of bed, but we know we got to do our, our Christian duty, and we have to go to church. So we get up, and we get ourselves dressed, and we come to church, and we just check off the box, I've done my Christian service for this week. I went to church. I'm all for going to church. I'm all for you being here this morning. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But how many times do we just go through the motions because it's what we do? We sing the songs, listening to, but not necessarily hearing the word of God preached. We come in these doors and we leave these doors the same way we came in. We've just gone through the motions happens in our own private devotions, our own private time with God. We set, a time, we set aside a time to read the Bible, and, and, and we're flooded with millions of little distractions here and there, and soon we're simply reading it to get it done, instead of reading it to learn and to grow spiritually. Our minds have already left the room. We're simply going through the motions. Do you see what I'm talking about this morning? Do you see how easy it is to become spiritually rusty? To begin to elevate form over relationship? To begin to say, everybody thinks that that I'm a good Christian person. I'm in church. I'm serving. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do but inside you know you're nothing more than a fake because there's no real relationship there. Oh, you could be saved. I'm not questioning salvation here. But you're just going through the motions. Someone once put it this way, it's okay to have routines in the Christian life, but to not be routine. Walking with Christ is never routine. And when it just becomes a routine, then we have elevated form over substance. And we're on the way to spiritual rust. Not only do we become spiritual, not only do we become spiritually rusty when we elevate form over substance, we become spiritually rusty when we elevate experience over theology. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we're not going to turn there this morning, but we have the events where King Saul offered the sacrifice that Samuel was supposed to offer. Samuel comes to King Saul after offering the sacrifice and says, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed. Therefore said I, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. 
Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. You read that passage in 1 Samuel there, and you learn that Saul became impatient. He knew what was right. He knew what he was supposed to do. Saul had been told in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou wilt do. King Saul had been told to wait seven days, and then Samuel would come. These seven days were evidently to teach Saul patience and dependence upon God. He waited the seven days but just barely. As soon as the week was up, he offered the sacrifice on his own, refusing to wait any longer for Samuel. Instead of waiting for Samuel and being obedient to the commands of God, King Saul elevated the experience of the sacrifice over the theology of what was right. He knew what was right from a theological perspective. He knew that that he had no right. Remember, we're in the Old Testament here. He had no right to offer that sacrifice. He knew what was right. But he elevated the experience over what was right. We have a tendency to do the same thing. I remember a friend of mine when I was in Bible college stating that she did not need to attend church because she could experience God in nature. Worship, for many, is experienced-based, focusing on the believer. How, How do we know if we have worshiped God? Because we get some emotional feeling or some emotional high, or because we know that we have entered into his presence. Most people that attend churches on Sunday morning could not even begin to come close to giving a biblical definition of what it means to worship based upon the Word of God. They think worship is just singing a few songs on Sunday morning. Instead of interpreting their experiences through the Word of God, they interpret the Word of God based upon their experiences. If I have experienced it, then it must be right. In today's world, many have allowed the live stream to take the place of physically gathering together. I'm thankful for live stream. I'm thankful for the, internet, or the technologies that we have today, but let me just say that, that live stream can never replace in-person gathering. I've actually had people tell me, I don't care what the Bible says. I had this experience, and therefore it must be true. We must remember that the Bible is the sole authority for all of life and practice. The Word of God is sufficient for all areas of life and trumps any experience that we, must, that we can have. We must gauge our experience based off of the Word of God, not the Word of God based off of our experience. If our experience contradicts the Word of God, then there's a problem either with our experience or with our understanding of the experience. You see, we, understand, we become spiritually rusty when we elevate form over substance. When going through the motions and showing, I'm a good Christian, look at me, ain't I something special, becomes more important than our personal relationship, our daily relationship with our Heavenly Father. We become spiritually rusty when we elevate experience over theology. I hope you can see this morning how easy it is for us to become spiritually rusty. I don't know about you, but I have found myself in that position more often than I care to admit. To where I begin to see flecks of rust coming up on my cast iron skillet. So how do we prevent spiritual rust? What can you and I do to prevent becoming spiritually rusty? Remember that cast iron pan that I mentioned earlier? A rusted cast iron pan can be restored. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes time. But it is possible. If you 
even begin to think that you have just a little bit of spiritual rust coming, you and I can be restored. In order to do so, we must focus on relationship. We must focus on relationship. The world does not really seem to understand this, but Christianity is not a religion. Religion is defined for us in the Word of God. Okay, In the book of James, it tells us what religion is, and it's not Christianity. The world around us believes that, that we have religion, and in their eyes we do because we're going through the motions of a religious people. But Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. And as we focus on the relationship, the form is not as important. Now, don't misunderstand me. How we worship, how we serve, how we conduct ourselves is important to God. But the problem comes when we elevate the form over function. And if you and I are going to per prevent rust in our spiritual lives, if we're going to work at preventing rust, we must focus on at least two relationships. First, we must focus on our relationship with God. We must elevate our relationship with God over the form. Remember the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul is one of my heroes of the faith. What was the most important thing in his life? God used him mar marvelously. God used him wonderfully to write over half of the New Testament. He used him to start churches over the then known world. It was said of the Apostle Paul that these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also in Acts chapter 17. But what was the most important thing to the Apostle Paul in his life? Was it the number of converts that he had won? As good as it is to lead people to the Lord, was that the most important thing in his life? No. The most important thing in the Apostle Paul's life was found in Philippians chapter 3, when it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The Apostle Paul said the most important thing in his life more important than his education, more important than his ministry, more important than any standing with men, the most important thing in his life was that he knew God. How important is your relationship to your Heavenly Father, to you? If you and I are going to prevent spiritual rust, we must focus on our relationship with him. And let me just say this, it's not enough to just focus on your relationship with him on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night. It is a seven day a week. And really, 24 hour a day thing, we must focus on our relationship with him as we go through our lives. And as we focus on our relationship with God, we must seek to be clean Isaiah 59 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear you. Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sin hinders our relationship with God. That is why David said in Psalms 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now David lived in a different dispensation than what you and I live today. We do not have to fear the removal of the Holy Spirit from our lives we are sealed. When you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. However, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Quench not the Spirit. To grieve the spirit is to act out in a sinful manner, whether it is in thought only or in action. When we grieve the, the Holy Spirit, we allow this, the beginnings of spiritual rust 
to develop. And let me just say, when that one fleck of rust comes, it's like a cancer and it spreads. Not only do we need to focus on our relationship with God in order to rem- prevent spiritual rust, we must also focus on our relationship with o- other believers, especially those within the church body. The relationship that believers have with each other is of vital importance. The book of John says that the world will recognize us as believers by our love. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. That phrase, one another, occurs over a hundred times in the New Testament. Over 59 of those times are occurrences with specific commands teaching us how to relate to one another. Think how you and I relate as members of the body is important to God. If he tells us over 59 different commands and times on how we are to relate to one another. Obedience to these commands is imperative. It it forms the basis for all true Christian community, and it has a direct impact on our witness to the world. In order to eliminate and to prevent spiritual rust, we must focus on our relationship with God and other believers. In addition, we must focus on our perspective. We must focus on our perspective. Let's consider very briefly Matthew chapter 6 this morning. Matthew chapter 6, and I'm not going to read the entire passage for the sake of time, beginning in verse 19 through verse 34. We have a passage here where it says, But um, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He goes on to say, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Um, also, he goes on, no man can serve two masters. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit onto a stature? Take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? clothed? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. The perspective. The Bible encourages us to take a check the map of God's word to see if we're still on the right road. It's wise to, for us to examine where we are in life and what is our perspective on life. Is our perspective on life here and now, or is it on eternity? It, where is our life headed? What is our plans? Where are we going with life? Am I focused on myself, or am I focused on what God wants? Is there any difference between God's plans for our life and our own life's goals? Am I more focused on going to work on Monday morning, or am I more focused on serving God at work? You see the difference in perspective. If we're to avoid spiritual rust, if we're to prevent spiritual rust, you and I must have an eternal perspective. To put it differently, we must live for eternity and not here and now. Our focus must be on things above and eternity rather than on this life. Believers are to have a different perspective on life than the unbelievers around us. The world, the unbelievers, they're concerned about this life. They're concerned about getting ahead. They're concerned about growing that bank account. They're concerned about about growing that retirement fund so that when they get old, they can enjoy life. Let me just say that's not to be our perspective on life. We're not to be focused on the here and now. We're to be focused on eternity. When we interact with somebody on a daily basis, whether it's at the store or the gas station or at work, when we interact with somebody, whether it's on the phone or whatever we're doing, our focus should not be on here and now. It should be on eternity and the soul of that person we're interacting with. The believer is to be concerned about the life to come. And if we're going to avoid avoid spiritual rust, if we're going to prevent spiritual rust in our life, we must focus on relationship and we must focus on perspective. We also must focus on surrender. We must focus on surrender. There are many people who want full control of their life. They refuse to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And today, the lost man refuses to surrender to, for Jesus, for uh, salvation. Why do you think evolution is so strong today? Because evolution makes myself God. It makes me God. 
And it says, I don't have to surrender. I don't have to be under the authority of a God because I myself am God. Many saved folks also refuse to surrender to Jesus' direction as well. A common phrase that I hear today in church is that I'm going to commit my life to Christ. Let me just say commit, commitment doesn't go far enough. Adrian Rogers tells a story about a conversation he had with a man from Romania named Joseph Thiessen. They were talking about the difference between commitment and surrender. Thiessen said, when you make a commitment, you are still in control no matter how noble the thing you commit to. One can commit to pray, study the Bible, give his money, to make automobile payments, or to lose weight. Whenever he or she chooses to do, they commit to it. Surrender is different. If someone holds a gun to your head and asks you to lift your hands in the air as a token of surrender, you don't tell that individual, I'm committed to you. You simply surrender and do as you're told. But the key word is surrender. We are to be slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're to avoid spiritual rust, we must surrender all to him. One night, a family of five was crammed into a Volkswagen, inching along in a heavy rainstorm. Suddenly, they saw a man and woman walking along the highway in the pouring rain. They pulled over and asked if they could help. They saw the woman was carrying a baby. She said that they lived a town several miles back, but lightning had caused a short in the wiring of their house, starting a fire that had burned their house to the ground. They had barely escaped with their lives and were walking to the next town seven miles away to stay with her sister until further provision could be made. Feeling sorry for the family and realizing that there was no room in the Volkswagen, the man pulled out $20, gave it to the woman, and drove off. A couple of miles down the road, he stopped the car and asked his family, how much money do you have? They pooled everything and came up with just under $100. He drove back to where the couple was still walking. Do you have the money I gave you, he asked. Surprised, the woman said, yes, we do. Then give it to me. Perplexed, she reached into her pocket and pulled out the 20 and handed it to him. He combined it with the money he had and handed it all to her, saying, here, our family would like you to have this. The story illustrates how God often treats you and I. He gives us so many wonderful gifts, and then he comes to us and says, I want them all back, all of them, every one of them. I want you to give them all back to me. He does this so he can combine them with his unlimited resources and give them all to us again. How easy it is for us to become spiritually rusty. How hard it is for you and I to prevent spiritual rust. So how can we purge spiritual rust out of our lives? How can we find ourselves restored, ready to be used? Well, first, if you're going to restore a rusty cast iron skillet, you must scrub it clean. Get the cat, get the stainless steel, the, the Brilla pad, and just really begin scrubbing and scrubbing. You want to scrub as much of that rust off as you can. I ha um, my grandpa used to use a wire bristle and a drill and, and use that to help clean the cast iron skillets that he would find. You must scrub it clean. If you and I are going to pur um, purge spiritual rust from our lives, we must be scrubbed clean. May we pray as David did, Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. May you and I ask God to scrub us clean. And let me just say scrubbing hurts. Have you ever washed dishes and you've had to really get in scrubbing and you got that Brillo pad on your skin? Or guys, you were working in the, it, on, under the car and you got your hand all greasy and oily and you had to go in and you had to scrub it. Sometimes it hurts. It hurts to be scrubbed. But it's a, it's a process that you and I must be willing to go through. If we're going to purge the spiritual rust out of our lives, we must ask God to scrub us clean. 
And we must give him the freedom to reveal things in our life that are uncomfortable for us to be revealed. The deeper the stain, the harder it is to scrub. Different fabrics, if you're doing laundry, different fabrics require different types of scrubbing. Some, you can just take the fabric and just kind of rub it together pretty gently. Some, you have to really get in there and scrub. For some of the stains in our life, for some of that spiritual rust, God's going to really have to do a job, and he's going to really have to apply the scrubber. For others, it's just a matter of just kind of wiping it off. But we must be willing to allow him to scrub us clean. God knows just what type of scrubbing that we need. Not only do we need to be scrubbed, we also must be oiled. Once that cast iron skillet is clean and the rust is pretty much removed, you have to go through and you have to oil the skillet. Or it's just going to rust again. Throughout the word of God, oil is a picture or a type of the Holy Spirit. It does two things. Oil makes something slick. A, A few days ago, There was an accident in our kitchen at home, and a glass bottle of olive oil was spilled and broke in the kitchen. There are spots of our kitchen floor that are still a little bit slick. As much as we've scrubbed it and scrubbed it, it makes it slick. I remember when I was working in Kansas City in a church for a youth activity one night, we we went turkey bowling, and I took the the fellowship hall of the church um, and oiled it. I got like a five-gallon jug of vegetable oil and spread it all over the fellowship hall. And then the teens had turkeys, and the the, the boys had turkeys, and the girls had um, hams, and we went turkey bowling. Set up some bowling pins down. Sound fun? Set up some bowling pins down there, and and they'd throw those turkeys down, and, and because it was all oiled, it would just slide right across the floor. Let me say that was a pain to clean up, but it makes things slick. When the Holy Spirit oils you, it allows the temptations to slide right off of you. When Satan comes up and he says, why don't you do this? Why don't you think this? Why don't you go here? The the oil of the Holy Spirit allows those temptations to just slide away. 1 Corinthians says that he will not suffer us to be tempted above above which we can bear as long as we're properly oiled. Are you oiled this morning? It also flavors. Oil also flavors. I'm not a grill master, but I like a good hamburger. I have learned over the years that although 93% meat, the the extra lean meat, is supposedly the best for you, it doesn't have the best flavor. You get that 80% grind, 80% meat, 20% fat, and there's just something about that taste there. That fat gives it a little bit of taste, that oil gives it a little bit of flavor. The Holy Spirit does that for you and I. Remember Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18? And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Are you oiled this morning? Are you filled with the Spirit? Is your life under His control, or is it under your control? Every believer... Every person is either under that person's control, in effect, under the control of Satan, or under the control of God, under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's not, I'm 50% under the control of the Spirit, and I'm 50% under the control of myself. It doesn't work that way. The car is either in drive or it's not. Who's controlling your life? If we're going to purge that spiritual rust, we must be oiled. Not only must the cast iron skillet be oiled, but once it's been scrubbed clean, and once it's been oiled, it must be tried. It must be tried. 
you take that cast iron skillet and you put it in an oven and you turn the heat on and you begin baking it. Scientists will tell us that as you bake that cast iron skillet that that oil literally becomes a part of the pan through a chemical process called polymerization. It's baked on. It's heated with heat. It's tried. Spurgeon put it this way. Whenever God means to make a man great, he first breaks him in pieces. Tozer put it like this. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Job 23, verse 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold, much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This trying process, it hurts. I know I've gone through these, tr these trying processes in my own life. It hurts, sometimes very, very deeply. The trying process that God uses for each one of us is a little bit different, but that doesn't change the fact that trying, that that proving process hurts. And at times, you just want to throw up your hands and say, where is God? I don't get it. I don't understand. but it's necessary. If we're going to restore, be restored back to usefulness, we must allow God to put us through that trying process. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They had no guarantee. We're going to look at them tonight. I want to encourage you to be back. We're going to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tonight. They had no guarantee that God was going to bring them out of the fiery furnace before they went in it. You remember what they told King Nebuchadnezzar? I may die, I may not die, but it's not going to change anything. And they went into the fiery furnace. But when they got there, what did they find? They found God right there beside them. Right there with them. Let me just tell you this this morning. If you're in the middle of one of those trying processes and you're just looking and saying, I don't get it. I don't even feel it. It doesn't even seem like God is real. I understand I've been there. But that's where we have to rest in the faith of God's word and know that he is right there, that he will never leave us. That's when we can take those promises and say, God, I don't feel it. I don't experience it, but I know your word is right. And I'm going to follow you and trust you. So let me just ask this morning in closing, what kind of cast iron pan are you? Are you oiled and tried and ready for use? Or have you allowed some rust to begin to build up? Maybe it's just I'm going to church on Sunday, I've checked my religious box and I've done my religious duty. I've written my tithe check and I've given my, my money to missions. I've done my, my Christianity duty. I've done what God wants for me. Let me just say God wants so much more. He wants you. He wants that relationship. If you've allowed spiritual rust to begin to build up, you don't have to stay in that rusty condition. God wants to restore you. He wants to use you. He's the God of second chances. He wants the opportunity to take the scrub brush to your life. Will you let him this morning? If you'd all stand with us, bow your heads, close your eyes. The pianist is going to come. She's going to turn to page number 277. I'm not going to ask that you sing this morning. I'm not going to ask that, that you, you turn in your hymn book to that page. But she's going to play 277. And as she plays, I'd like to ask you this morning, allow the Holy Spirit to do a work. Reveal to you, are you beginning to get rusty? If so, the altar is open as you play. You can either come to the front or you can do business with God there at your seat, however you deem necessary. But do business with God 
Ask him to purge that rust out of your life. Maybe you'd say, Pastor Elliot, I don't have that rust you're talking about this morning. I, I'm clean, I'm oiled, I'm tried, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to be used. Fantastic. Spend this next few moments as she plays.